for decades, the image of Neanderthals was pretty, um, well, pretty one-dimensional, right? Just focused on survival. Yeah, very basic. But a recent discovery is really starting to challenge that picture. It hints at uh, maybe a capacity for abstract thought we're only just beginning to understand. It's fascinating. And what's really compelling, I think, is that this new find goes beyond just tools or, you know, how they hunted. Exactly. We're looking at something quite different here. It forces us to reconsider, maybe, the nuances of Neanderthal behavior. Totally. So today we're doing a deep dive into what seems like a pretty unremarkable object found in Spain, just a simple pebble. But the story it holds, well, that's anything but simple. Right. Think of this as your shortcut to getting up to speed on this really exciting discovery and what it might mean. Yeah. And our main source for this is a research paper called uh, More Than a Fingerprint on a Pebble, a pigment-marked object from San Lazaro Rock Shelter in the Context of Neanderthal Symbolic Behavior. Quite a title. It is, but it lays out the analysis of this artifact very meticulously. So our mission today is basically to unpack all the details of this find. We want to understand what it really tells us about Neanderthal's symbolic thinking. Moving past those old stereotypes, really exploring if they had a richer, more complex cognitive world than we thought. Exactly. So let's start with the basics. Where did this interesting pebble actually turn up? Okay, so it was found in the San Lazaro rock shelter that's in Segovia in central Spain. In Spain, particularly the Iberian Peninsula, that's significant, isn't it, in terms of Neanderthals? Very significant. It's known as one of the last areas, sort of a refuge, where Neanderthal populations lived in Europe. Okay, so this discovery is from a time when Neanderthals were kind of nearing the end of their run in that region adds a layer of intrigue. It does. The specific layer where they found the pebble, level H, is identified as Mosterian. Which is firmly Neanderthal tool technology, right? Correct. And the dating places this layer at around uh, 43,000 years ago. That's based on radiocarbon dating of level H and another nearby level, level D. 43,000 years. Wow. And interestingly, one charcoal sample from level H gave an even older date, actually beyond the reliable limit for carbon-14 dating. So a clear Neanderthal presence back then. Were there other sites nearby from the same time? Yes, just a few hundred meters away, actually. Sites like Abrigo de Molina also show Mosterian occupation, dated between roughly 44,000 and 41,000 years ago. Okay. And importantly, there's no evidence at these sites of later Homo sapiens occupations from the Paleolithic. It really solidifies the picture of Neanderthals being quite established in this valley during uh, what's called Marine Isotope Stage 3. Which was a major glacial period, right? So okay. that influenced their environment. Definitely. Okay, so we've got the where and the when. Let's talk about the pebble itself. What did it actually look like? Right, the pebble. It's made of quartz-rich granite. The shape is kind of flattened, sub-ellipsoidal. Okay. And it's a decent size, about 21 centimeters long, 11 wide, and maybe 7 or 8 centimeters thick. So not tiny. Not at all. But the really striking features are on one face. There are three small, natural, cup-like depressions, cupules. Natural depressions. Mostly natural, yes. And positioned sort of centrally among them is a small, almost circular red mark. Three little dips and a red dot. Okay, that already sounds like more than just a random rock. So the first question archaeologists usually ask is, was it a tool? Any signs of practical use? That was the logical first step, yeah. They compared it with other pebbles found right there in level H. Many of those were clearly hammerstones. They had the wear marks. Ah, okay. But those hammerstones were generally smaller, more rounded, and didn't have any ochre or these natural concavities. Our pebble is significantly larger than those tools. Much bigger, and no signs of being used as a hammer or anything. Right. Detailed macroscopic analysis, even 3D standing, ruled out use as a hammerstone or an anvil or for abrasion, nothing like that. What about those cupules, the depressions? Well, the microtopography showed that two of them had the smooth profile you'd expect from natural formation, but the third one looked a bit more irregular. Irregular, meaning possibly modified. Possibly, yeah. It suggests maybe some alteration. Interesting. But even if one was slightly altered, that doesn't explain the red dot or even why yeah. this specific pebble was carried into the rock shelter, does it? Precisely. And that's another key point. This type of rock, Luca granite, isn't common right near the shelter. Oh, so where did it come from? Geological analysis points to the Eresma River, which is about five kilometers away. Five kilometers. So someone carried it there. 
It seems very likely. While similar pebbles are in the riverbed, they aren't just lying around near the site, and the archaeological layers themselves don't suggest any natural way a pebble this large could have ended up inside the shelter during the Neanderthal occupation. Plus, they were carrying other stones in, like the hammer stones. Exactly, which strongly suggests this larger, unique pebble was also intentionally transported there. Okay, deliberately brought in. Let's get to that red dot. What did they figure out about what it is? They used X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, XRF. That showed the red dot had a totally different geochemical signature compared to the pebble around it. Meaning it was definitely added, not just a natural part of the rock. Exactly. It strongly indicated it was applied. Okay, so what was the red stuff? For that, they used scanning electron microscopy, SEM. The analysis confirmed it's ochre. Ochre, so like iron oxides? Iron oxides and clay minerals, yeah a classic pigment used for a long, long time. And significantly, they didn't find any organic binders mixed in with it. No binders. And how was it put on? Did they figure that out? Well, the analysis suggested the application wasn't random. It seemed quite deliberate and possibly applied just with the tip of a finger. With a finger? Wow. Okay, so a non-tool pebble carried 5K, deliberately marked with red ochre, maybe with a finger. This is really moving away from the old stereotypes. It certainly is. Now, the paper's title mentions more than a fingerprint, yeah. didn't they? Did they actually find a fingerprint? This is where the story gets really remarkable. They use something called multispectral analysis. Okay, what's that? It's a technique that can reveal details hidden beneath the surface using things like photoluminescence and UV reflectography. They looked really closely at the ochre dot and also the biggest of the three cupules. And what did this high-tech analysis show? Right on the surface of that ochre dot, it revealed an image consistent with a dermatoglyphic print. Wait, dermatoglyphic? You mean a fingerprint? In essence, yes, a fingerprint. A fingerprint on a 43,000-year-old Neanderthal artifact. Because... It, that's incredible. How could they be sure? Well, they didn't just rely on the image. That image was meticulously examined by forensic specialists, experts in fingerprint identification. Okay, proper forensic analysis. Absolutely. They looked at key features, the width of the ridges, the tiny details called minutia, like ridge endings and bifurcations. The stuff they use in criminal investigations. Exactly, those kinds of details. They even used the automated biometric identification system, ABICE, and analyzed 13 specific minutia points on the print. 13 points. That sounds pretty thorough. What did they find? They measured the average ridge width at 0.48 millimeters. The ridges had a kind of purling or beading look. Okay. And when they compared those 13 minutia points to modern human fingerprint databases, yeah. they found compatibility. The pattern could match prints from either a fingertip, the distal phalanx, or possibly the palm. So it looks like a human fingerprint. But obviously, we don't have a Neanderthal fingerprint database to compare to directly, right? Correct. That's a limitation we have to acknowledge. But the general morphological characteristics, the basic structure of fingerprints, are likely comparable between Neanderthals and modern humans. Okay. So what does all this mean, then? A fingerprint, pigment, a deliberately chosen pebble. Hmm. What does it tell us about Neanderthal behavior? Well, it adds significant weight to this growing body of evidence that's challenging the old view, the view that Neanderthals lacked symbolic capacity. Right, because we already knew they used ochre for something, and there's other evidence popping up. Increasingly, yes. We have evidence for personal adornments, like shells or eagle talons, maybe some deliberate engravings on bone or cave walls in various places across Europe. So this fingerprint, linked directly to putting pigment on a non-functional, carefully chosen object, it feels hard to argue that was just an accident, doesn't it? The researchers argue very strongly against it being accidental. Think about it. There are no wear marks suggesting tool use. Right. There's just this single fingerprint right in the middle of the ochre. Not smeared all over. Exactly. No other ochre residue anywhere else on the pebble. And they even did statistical analysis showing that the placement of the red dot relative to those three cupules is pretty unlikely to be just random chance. Okay, so all signs point towards it being intentional. That seems to be the most logical conclusion, yes. Intentionality. So what are the implications if it was intentional? Well, the pebble's unique features its size, the natural cupules combined with that purposeful ochre mark, strongly suggest it wasn't just random doodling. The researchers bring up the idea of portable art. Portable art, created by a Neanderthal. In a broad archeological sense, yes, a deliberately modified or marked object that might hold some kind of symbolic meaning. Wow, 
okay? And how might the cupules, those depressions, tie into the symbolism? This leads to probably the most intriguing hypothesis they propose. Face pareidolia. Pareidolia. Mm -hmm. That's seeing familiar patterns like faces and random things, right? Like in clouds or burnt toast. Exactly that. It's a well-known human cognitive bias. The researchers suggest that the three cupules and that centrally placed red dot might have been seen by a Neanderthal or perhaps enhanced by them to represent a face. So a cupules maybe is eyes and a mouth and the dot? Maybe contributing to the facial pattern, perhaps like a nose ridge, or just enhancing the faceness. There are other examples in prehistory where objects with natural features suggesting faces seem to have been recognized or marked. Is there any reason to think Neanderthals would even do that? See faces and things? Well, the tendency to see faces is deeply wired into our brains, likely with deep evolutionary roots. It's crucial for social interaction. Studies with primates show they experience it too. So given that Neanderthals had large brains and complex social structures, it's entirely plausible they shared this tendency. So it's a possible explanation. It's a compelling working hypothesis, as the researchers put it. They're careful to acknowledge the difficulty in definitively interpreting something this ancient, of course. Of course. So we've got this pebble, deliberately picked, carried miles, marked with ochre leaving a fingerprint, possibly because it looked like a face. This really does shift how we might think about Neanderthal minds, and we're sure it was Neanderthals, not later humans. The dating evidence seems very strong on this. The most Styrian context, the date's around 43,000 years ago. Neanderthals disappeared from inland Iberia around 44,000 to 42,000 years ago. And modern humans arrived. The earliest solid evidence for anatomically modern humans in that specific region seems to be several thousand years later. There's just no indication of overlap or mixing at San Lazaro or the nearby sites. Okay, that's critical. It really pins it on the Neanderthals. Mm. So what makes this find so exceptionally important beyond just the cool factor of the fingerprint? It's the combination of factors, the clear Mysterian context, the deliberate transport, how it was found marked face up, apparently. Oh, really? Yes. Plus the ochre dot and, of course, the fingerprint itself. It all points towards potentially complex cognitive processes. Like? Like mental conception, having an idea, deliberate communication, perhaps, or at least attribution of meaning. These are key parts of symbolism, even maybe early forms of non-figurative art. You mentioned another Neanderthal fingerprint find earlier. Dude. What does this compare? Right? The one from Königsau in Germany that's mm -hmm. also very old, potentially a similar age. Ah. But it was found on a piece of birch bark pitch, possibly used as an adhesive. So more functional. Potentially, yes. The San Lazaro print is different because it's directly linked to putting pigment on a non-utilitarian object. It suggests a more deliberate, symbolic, or aesthetic action, perhaps. And the researchers point out it's currently the oldest known object like this in Europe bearing a fingerprint. It is truly amazing to think a single fingerprint gives us such a direct, almost personal link to a Neanderthal individual from so long ago. And this discovery it doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? There's other evidence for Neanderthal symbolism building up. Not at all. As we mentioned across Europe, the picture is growing. We have cave paintings attributed to Neanderthals in Spain, engravings on bones, modified shells with ochre, the use of pigments, adornments. So this fits into that broader pattern. It adds a really significant piece to that puzzle. It suggests Neanderthals' symbolic abilities, maybe their artistic expression, were more developed than previously thought and perhaps just manifested differently from the kind of art we see later in the Upper Paleolithic with modern humans. So boiling it down for everyone listening, What's the really key insight to take away from this deep dive into one little pebble? I think the most profound takeaway is that this object, this pebble with its fingerprint and ochre mark, gives us really compelling evidence for Neanderthal abstract thought, for the potential for symbolic communication. And maybe even one of the earliest examples we have of someone recognizing and marking something that looked like a face. Potentially, yes. It's a powerful possibility. It's a real aha moment, isn't it? Yeah. Just thinking that a fingerprint, something so small on an object this old, could give us a peek into the individual actions, maybe even the perceptions, of a Neanderthal. It really does challenge those older, often quite simplistic views we had about their cognitive abilities. And it highlights how important it is to look really closely at everything found in the archaeological record, even things that seem mundane at first glance. Absolutely. They can hold these incredible clues. Huge clues. It really makes you wonder then, if one fingerprint on one marked pebble can tell us this much, what other stories about Neanderthal lives, their minds, 
might still be out there waiting in the ground. Exactly. What else haven't we found or fully understood yet? Maybe it's time we really started thinking about the whole human story in a much broader, much more inclusive way.